Good morning, church. Uh, last night, Jennifer and I were watching an episode of The Chosen, and like I do after each episode, I go to the Bible and research what I just watched. So this morning when I was doing that, um, a note fell out of my Bible. It was a letter I wrote to Jesus this past December, and uh, God said, read it to the church. Even though I fail you, your love shines upon me. Your gentleness is warm and sweet. My smile can never be too big when I think about you. Your protection, peace, and faithfulness overwhelms and calms my soul. So I read from uh, Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. We pray with me. Oh my, what a strong and powerful promise from you, God, how loving you are to give us the same spirit that raised your son from the dead. Forgive me, forgive us for not tapping into it. Your love draws us closer to you, an amazing, frightful love lavished on us all. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everyone. So happy you are here this morning with us. For those who are joining us via live stream, good morning to you all as well. So happy you're here with us. Uh, hear this word from the Gospel of Matthew. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not of more value than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? the Gentiles, for the world seeks after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, and so therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I don't know where you are this morning, you could be saying, Matt, this doesn't really apply to me, I'm having a great day, I'm on cloud nine spiritually. That's awesome. I'm so happy you're in church this morning. Uh, but for those of you that, that are, are like me that struggle with problems sometimes, you know, life can be a little bit lifeish. Um, you, may, you may have your, your blinders on and all you see is your, your troubles, whether it's something that um, somebody has done to you or you've done to somebody. Um, can I just say that I'm happy you're here this morning. You have a God that that sees you, that loves you, that values you, that knows exactly what you're going through. Uh, and, and through prayer, we can talk with him, talk with the creator of the universe and have that relationship with him. Um, and just say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I need your help. And he's faithful. He is faithful. He is a good father. Let's stand as we say. Oh, I need you. You're forgiven. 
of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. We worship the God who was we worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, oh, 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 we shout out your praise, we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. We 
Cause he hung up on that cross And he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise We were the beggar Now we're royalty We were the prisoner Now we're run and free We are forgiven, accepted Redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise We were the beggars We were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoner Now we're run and free We are forgiven, accepted Redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Kids, it is time for kids worship. <laughs> oh, I love it. We'll see you guys after church in the gym. As they're doing that, let's come back to worship. All throughout my history, Faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life all over my life help me remember when I'm weak fear may come but fear will leave You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises. Fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. See the cross, see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. I see the cross, the empty grave, the 
evidence is endless All my sin rolled away Because of you, oh Jesus Oh, I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life all over my life, oh, I see the evidence of your goodness. All over my life, all over my life, I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. Why should I fear? Why should I fear? Oh, the evidence is here. Amen. And it's true. Like I said before, you may be blinded by what's going on around in your life, but the evidence of his goodness is everywhere. All we have to do is just look for it and say, God, I don't know what's going on. Lead me. I'll follow. You are good. You are Jireh. You are enough. Amen. 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 I'll never be more loved than I am right now wasn't holding you up so there's nothing I can do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now going through a storm but I won't go down I hear your part carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. And you, you would cross the an ocean, so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. And you are gyro, you are enough. Enough, and I will be content in every circumstance. You are Jira, you are enough, forever enough, always enough, more than enough. I don't want to forget. How I feel right now on the mountaintop I can see so clear what it's all about So stay by my side when the sun goes down Don't want to forget how I feel right now You are a gyro, you are enough Circumstance, you are Jira, you are enough. And if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you? And if he watches over. How much more does he 
thank you that you are indeed Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Lord. We thank you for that. Thank you for being a God who not only knows our needs, Father, you're not just aware of them, but you're able to meet our needs at every season of our life. And, and we praise you for that, Father. We're here today. Thank you for the time already that we've had to worship you through song and prayer and reading of your word. Father, I pray now that as we continue to worship through the study of your word, that you would uh, meet each one of us in a very personal way, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just connect with our hearts and our minds and our lives, and Father, convict us where we need to be convicted, encourage us where we need encouraging, um, challenge us, Father, where we need to be challenged, and affirm, Heavenly Father, your strength, your power, and your provision in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Band, we appreciate your, your leadership. Praying for Sean, who's not with us today. Did you mention that already? No, sir. Yes, our drummer is, is not with us today. We're praying for him, and we have a guest drummer. Thanks for being here, wherever you went. Uh, yeah, you did a good job. Uh, hope you have your Bible with you today. I want to encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Uh, we're in the first uh, section of this, this series, I, I mean, of this uh, uh, chapter I told you last week that if you think of all the Bible, now all the Bible is inspired, I hesitate to say this because I don't want to kind of put part of the Bible up against another part because it's all inspired, it's all living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, and every piece of the Bible can touch our hearts, but many commentators will point to Romans as a, a, a jewel there in Scripture because there's so much truth there, there's so much practical truth in the book of Romans about our relationship with God and how He works in our life. And then the eighth chapter of Romans is sort of the pinnacle of that mountain range, if you want to think of it that way. In fact, I, was, I would say, and I said this in the early service, if you want to kickstart your spiritual walk, if you just kind of feel like you're in a rut and you need to, you have to kind of kickstart your spiritual walk, let me just encourage you to read the eighth chapter of Romans. Just read it every day for a week. And I believe that you will be encouraged by that. In fact, this will be a great time to do it because we're going to spend the next few weeks studying here in the 8th chapter. We're sort of doing a high-level view of Romans this time uh, as we go through it, but we're going, to, we're going to camp out in Romans 8 for a few weeks, and so you may just want to uh, spend some time reading every morning for a, a month, uh, and you'll be amazed what happens in your Christian walk, the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And, and today we're starting in verse 5, which really is all about the difference in our thinking. Once we allow God to come into our life and to begin to transform us, the title of this series is Transformed. When he does that, he changes the way that we think. So let's pick it up in verse 5 today, Romans chapter 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So he's, he's contrasting two ways of thinking. What's the, what are you thinking about? Things of the flesh, things of the world, sin, or the things of the Spirit, right? Verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. That sounds pretty good, right? For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. That's the word in the Bible. It's someone, uh, I think King James says that enmity with God, against God, at war with God. The mind that's set on the flesh is at war with God, hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, he says, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh, he says, cannot please God. Now, Look at verse 9, because Paul begins to speak to, to, I'm going to say to you and me, most of us in this room this morning, I'm aware, are, are Christians. Not everybody is, I understand that. Most of us, though, are, who's a Christian, Paul is talking directly to us here. Look at verse 9. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to God. But if, this is verse 10, now that word if, or, uh, could really be translated since, because he's, he's making an assumption that you do belong to God. So since Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And then verse 11, if, again, the word since, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So you've probably come to, if you're, if you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for a little while, you've probably come to learn that your mindset can determine your entire lifestyle. In fact, frankly, even if you're not a Christian, you know that. The things that you think on, it's really going to direct the way that you go in your life, right? It's, it's, it's going to guide you in the way that you go in life. So your, your, the way your thought pattern, your pro, thought processes are going to determine your lifestyle. And that's why the Apostle Paul is making this contrast here between the mind which is set on the flesh, the things of the world, sin. I'm just going to say sin this morning. So he's contrasting that against the mind that is set on the things of the Spirit. And so first, I just want us to look at what he says about that first uh, thought process, right? The mind that is set on the flesh, the mind that is set on sin. In verse 6, he says, it's death. The mind that's set on sin is death. It produces what we would call a deadly lifestyle. And I want to just share with you three things this morning about what Paul says here. Most of them, just you, you could pick it out. You probably could fill in the blanks without me telling you the answers because it's right there in Scripture. But number one, a mind that's set on sin, a mind that's set on the flesh, cannot please God. That's what verse, verse 8 says. The mind that's set on those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's a very definite statement, right? It's not sort of a, well, you might not, it's going to make it more difficult to please God. No, you can't. He just says you can't. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, 6 says, without faith, without faith in God, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. You can't do it. Because anyone who comes to him must first of all believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so it's impossible to please God without faith, without believing in him, without having a mind set on him. And here's the thing. Researchers have surveyed Americans. And did you know that most Americans, believe it or not, and you might not believe it, you know, if you hear the, you listen a lot to the, the news, but the reality is most Americans really want to please God. They may have different ideas of who God is or what God is, but they want to please whatever they're, even atheists say, you know, I don't believe in God, but I want to please him. If there was one, I'd want to please him. And of course, most people think that the way you please God is by, you know, cleaning up your act. Uh, I want to please God. Well, we just kind of naturally have this idea that even people that are non-religious, or don't really care about, you know, agnostics, they, agnostics are sort of like atheists who are at least honest, you know, they because I think most atheists kind of have to acknowledge there could be a God out there, but they don't want to. But agnostics will say, you know, I think if there was a God, the way that I'd make him happy is by cleaning up my act. So we think of God, at least they may want to complain about God as a bad guy, but they think to please him, you're going to do something good. But the Bible says that if our mind's not set on the things of God, if it's not set on the things of the Spirit, we can't. It's just, it's, you're gonna, it's gonna be a futile exercise, and you're gonna be frustrated in trying to do that, trying to please him. 
We spend a lot of our time trying to just push out the bad things in our life, the habits, the attitudes, the, the uh, hurtful actions that we have in our life, just to get rid of those bad thoughts in our life. And we find out we can't do it on our, on our own. We just cannot. We don't possess the power to do that. Instead, the Bible says we need to come to a place where we trust God enough to be obedient to His Spirit, which means we need to allow the life of Jesus to live in us and to replace let Jesus replace those bad habits and those bad uh, sins in our life and let the life of the Holy Spirit now take up residence and power in our, in our life. And if you don't understand that great truth, that's very simple, right? If you don't, un- don't understand that great truth, then you're just going to walk around very frustrated in your spiritual life because you can't do it on your own. You, you just can't. And so the first truth here is that it's impossible to please God as long as our mind is set on the flesh, on, on the satisfying the things of this world. And the reason is that, uh, he says, we really don't belong to Jesus. If that's, if that's the, the focus of our life, then look at verse 9. He says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to Him. So the second thing we see here in our, in our notes here is that the mind that is set on sin really doesn't know God personally. If the focus of our life is, is sin and the, and the flesh, the, the reality is we just don't know. We don't have a personal relationship with God. Now, you may be wondering, how can you tell the difference between someone who belongs to Christ and someone who doesn't belong to Christ? Well, verse 9 says that, that they don't possess the Spirit of Christ. They don't belong to Christ. You know, Jesus was very um, frank with his disciples uh, by the way, I don't know how many of you are watching, and Scott mentioned it when he opened today, the, the series The Chosen. How many of you have seen any of that? That's, that's awesome. I love it. Okay. Uh, even if you've seen it, I know Jeannie and I have watched it twice now. We had not seen the third season yet, but tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, we're going to start showing it. Uh, Carrie Gerland, sorry, is going to, I messed up on the phone call the other day. She got a promotion several years ago. She's Carrie Gerland. Um, that's the way you said it, Dave, right? Um, so we're, she's going to lead just showing the chosen on, on Monday night, starting tomorrow night. Phil's going to share this again, but I just want to go ahead and put a plug in. I love the series because it shows uh, Jesus and his disciples. It kind of fills in some blank notes. It's a dramatic presentation, right? It's based completely on the Gospels. And as Jeannie and I have watched it a couple of times, and I hadn't found anything that... Uh, there's a lot that's not in Scripture, but there's not anything I see that's not biblical. Does that make sense? So it's a wonderful telling of it, and it just brings life to some of the disciples and their personalities and some that you would, you would never thought of Matthew the way that he's portrayed in this, but it's a powerful presentation. But anyway, so Jesus had these interactions with the disciples, and so it, it helps me to just see him sitting there with his friends uh, and, and teaching them, and they recognize he's, he, they recognize he's somebody special, and they, they, begin to, they continue to grow in their understanding of who Jesus is the more they get to know him. But Jesus looks at the disciples, Matthew 7, 21, and he says, you know what? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people can say religious things and do religious things. But he says, you know, not everybody that says Christian stuff will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, how do you know? He says, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven, that's how you know. The one who's obedient, the one whose life is transformed by my spirit, the one who's who's trusting me is the one who's given control of his or her life to God. And you're going to know the difference because they look different. You can claim to be a Christian all day long, Jesus is saying. You can even go through a lot of religious rituals, but the Bible says if you don't know God personally, then you don't belong to Christ. And the evidence that someone's just playing Christian games is, is putting on a Christian facade is that ultimately they don't submit to God. They just don't do it. All right, so that's number two. Uh, and I mean, number three is, is, that, is just that. They don't submit to God. A mind that is set on the things of the world is they don't submit to God. Look at verse six again. For to set the mind on the flesh on the, is death. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Now, let me, just, let me just explain this kind of quickly, because some of you are going to say, well, I see a lot of people 
whose mind, who I know in their mind are certainly not set on the things of the Spirit. And they're walking around and they look like they're just doing fine and dandy. So explain that to me. Well, you got to remember in the New Testament, there's two different words for life. There's a word bios. We get our word biography from it. I mean, biology from it, not biography. Well, biography too, actually, because it speaks of, of just physical life. Biography is the, the story of someone's physical life. Biology is the study of life physically. But the New Testament has, the New Testament uses that word, but it also uses another word in the Greek, and that's the word zoe. And, it, and that word means, it re- refers to a quality of life, spiritual life, a vitality of life. And there are a lot of people who have bios, they're walking around and they're breathing and they're living, but they don't have the zoe that Jesus promised, the quality of life. They're breathing, but they're, they're not thriving spiritually. In fact, verse 7 in our passage here in Romans 8 goes further. It says, for the mind that's set on the flesh, as I said earlier, is hostile to God, at war with God, for it does not submit to God's law, so that you're battling against, against God. And he says, indeed, it can't. It can't set, submit to God's law, because it's just at war with God. One of the most fascinating uh, verses in the New Testament is in 1 Timothy. Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor. Paul's teaching him how to be a pastor and talking about situations that are going to show up in the church. And there's a particular one that Paul is aware of there at the church in Ephesus. And, and he says, he's, he's talking about a certain woman, a specific woman who's living only for pleasure. And his very pointed observation is this. This is 1 Timothy 5, 6. But she, now this, he's talking about a specific person. This could be a he too, right? In this situation, it's a lady but it can apply to anyone, right? But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. There's no Zoe there. There's no vibrancy in life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have that vibrancy spiritual life. So that's a description of someone whose mind is set on the things of the flesh, but really doesn't know God. So that's, that's what the Bible says there. So God gives, I mean, Paul gives us this this, this kind of bad news, but the Bible is, is not just a bad news book. I want you to understand that. In fact, the gospel is good news. That's what it means. And sometimes we need to understand the bad news, so we need to recognize this, this uh, mind that's set on the flesh first so we can recognize just how good the good news really is. And that's what uh, he, he's, he speaks about here in this passage as well. Look at the second part of verse 6. He says, But to set the mind on the Spirit, on the Holy Spirit, is, is life. It's Zoe, right? That's spiritual life and it's peace. That sounds good. Is there anybody that you know of, anybody in this room that doesn't really want to live a life that's full of tranquility and peacefulness and serenity and security, having a peace with God? You're not at war with God anymore. Anybody in here that doesn't want to do that? It sounds like a good way to go, right? So how do we do it? Well, the only way that we can do that, Paul says, is to set our mind on the things of the Spirit. So let's just look at as we finish up, three ways that the Holy Spirit uh, relates to us as Christians. What happens in our life when the Holy Spirit takes control? First of all, a mind that is set on the Spirit is indwelt by the Holy Spirit himself. I'm going to explain that word in a minute. Look at verse 9. He says, you, however, are not, are not in the flesh. Christians, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Some translations do use that word indwelt, which means that we become literally the residence, the dwelling place of God. When you become a Christian, he takes up residence in your life, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And because he's living in us and we trust him, then we're to give him complete control of our life. That's number two. The mindset on the Spirit is filled, is controlled with the Spirit. We're controlled by the Spirit of God, filled with the Spirit. The Bible says that we are to be filled, we're to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Verse 9 again, Paul says in essence, you believers, you're not controlled by the sinful nature anymore. You're not, your mind's not set on that anymore. Instead, you're, not, you're filled with the Spirit. You're controlled by the Spirit. Let me just say this. It's important for us to recognize. There's a difference between being indwelt by the Spirit 
and being filled with the Spirit. Let me explain it because it's important for us to understand. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've trusted Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit is living in you. To be honest, you're always, uh, fill, uh, contr- uh, not, he, he's al- you're always indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He has taken up residence in your life. But now if you give an honest reckoning of yourself, can you honestly say that you're always controlled by the Spirit? He's living in you. He's, you're indwelt. Can you say that your life is always controlled by the Holy Spirit? Be honest. No, you don't have to answer out loud, but just <laughs> think to yourself. The answer is no, by the way. I just know that. And it's not because I know most of you and I'm thinking bad of you. It's just the reality of our, Paul just spent the entire chapter 7 talking about that. Because sometimes our mind listens to that old sinful nature. Sometimes we just, we're just looking back at the things of the flesh. And the, the choice that we have is, is yours, it's mine. It's, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to listen to the things of the world? Or are we going to listen to the Spirit of God who dwells in our life? And right there, I know that some of you are thinking, wait a minute, does that mean that you know, when I become a Christian and the Holy Spirit indwells in me, then later on I get more of the Holy Spirit of God? Is that the way it works? No, not at all. You never get any more of the Spirit. When He, when he moves into your life, you get all the Spirit of God. The Holy, Holy Spirit moves into your life. What happens is He gets more of you. You give more allegiance and more obedience and more trust to the Holy Spirit. He's living, he's living in you. And so being filled with the Holy Spirit, being controlled by the Holy Spirit, is not getting more of God. Why would God hold something back from you when you get saved? Say, yeah, you're saved, but you're not saved enough. <laughs> you get saved better, and I'll give you a little bit more of my Holy Spirit. That's not the way it works. God gives you all of the Holy Spirit. What happens is we're, we're holding some things back, and we're growing. That's what the Christian life is all about. We're growing in Christ. It's God getting more of you. There's nowhere in the New Testament where Christians are commanded to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? Because it just happens naturally when we trust Christ. You don't have to go out and figure out how to get indwelt. We are, we're indwelt by the Spirit of God. Hey, Terry? I was up here, all right? Thanks. <laughs> all right, so when you, when you become a Christian, when you, when you become a Christian, the Spirit of God takes up residence in your life, and, 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 and you get all of, all of the Holy Spirit. But several times in the New Testament, so we're, we're, we're not commanded to be indwelt, that just happens, but there are te- times in the New Testament where we're commanded to be filled, right? The Bible does command us to be filled, to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. God wouldn't command you to do something if it just automatically happened, right? It just it happens because we're, we're indwelt because of, we've trusted Christ, but he commands us to be controlled by the Spirit of God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that means that you've totally surrendered to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit. And, and when that happens, and what happens is the person of Jesus Christ is being reproduced through your life. When, when we're discipled, when we grow as disciples, then the person of Jesus Christ is going to be reflected through our life. The fruit of the Spirit is going to be evidence in our life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's when the personality of Jesus is, is flowing through you. So let me, let me just remind you again that the victorious Christian life, this is so important, and I say it a lot, I know, is not you looking at Jesus and trying to imitate him. That's, it's not what it's, because you can't do that. You, 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 we don't possess the power to imitate Jesus. You can say some of the words that Jesus said. You can memorize some of the, his great quotes, but you can't truly imitate the life of Jesus. You can't respond to people the way that, in your own power the way that Jesus did, but he can through you. So the key to the Christian life is just surrendering, just saying, Jesus, I'm giving you my life, and I'm surrendering this to the Spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of me, and I'm yielding to him. I'm yielding to him to live his life through me. And you may say, well, okay, then I want to do that. Why is it that I find myself like Paul? And I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling with this. I still have these things that I don't want to do that I'm doing and the things that I do want to do. Why? Well, it may be simply that you don't believe the Holy Spirit can control your life. Maybe it's just unbelief. That, that may be the reason. You really don't believe that he can do that. You may still be under the assumption that you have to do it yourself. 
So unbelief may be one of the reasons that you're not really controlled by the Spirit of God. You're still trying to work it out in your flesh. Another reason, so that's one, another reason may be simply that, uh, that you have unconfessed sin in your life. One of the reasons that many people struggle with allowing the Holy Spirit to live and control their life is because they have unconfessed sin in their life. I know a lot of you, like me, have been following what's going on in Claremore, Oklahoma at Asbury, this revival, this awakening that's going on at the college. I mentioned this last week. It began a uh, typical chapel service on a Wednesday a week and a half ago uh, there in, in, uh, at Asbury. They just, 10 o'clock, I think Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they have chapel. 10 o'clock, they had chapel. And it's, they said, a fairly typical chapel service. The, uh, the fellow who spoke that day, I'm not sure exactly even who he was, which is another reason I think this is, this is genuine. There's no personalities involved. I can't tell you the name of anybody that's involved in this except the Holy Spirit and Yeshua, Jesus. But the guy you know, spoke about the love of God and living that out in his life, and they closed the, disciple, the uh, chapel service, but it didn't end. Some of the people just stayed. The band kept playing. And finally, one of the students got up and, and just began to have, share a testimony of confession. And he just shared his heart with the people there in the room. And they said that as he spoke, the people that were there, the eyewitnesses said they just, in that moment, just it's like they felt a wind coming through the room. You know, we talked last week about the uh, Greek word pneuma, the wind, that's the Holy Spirit. They could just feel the Spirit blowing through the room. And they stayed, and they just continued to worship. They didn't put out posters or get, get a committee together. They just kept worshiping. And they kept worshiping. And the afternoon, the, the president of Asbury praised God for this man who was sensitive to the Spirit of God. He just sent word to the classes that said, look, if you want to go to the chapel, there's something going on there, and you're welcome to go. And so some of the students just started going to the, the chapel. It wasn't planned. It wasn't orchestrated. And they just continued to worship. Today, if, if you've been following it, you're aware that, that uh, as far as last night, last, I guess it's middle, early this morning I looked again, they're still worshiping. It's been a week and a half. They're still worshiping. They've opened, uh, the, there's a college there that started in the college chapel. They opened the seminary chapel as well. I think a couple other churches, there's at least four locations now where that's going on. But there are people that are driving from all over the country to get there. It's been like 30 degrees and the... Uh, uh, people were waiting four hours outside to get in, but they finally just said, what are we waiting for? Let's just worship God here and praise God here. And they, Matt, they just started, no, you're not Matt, they just, Matt's wife, uh, <laughs> they just started <coughs> praising God and worshiping Him out there, outside in the cold, uh, to just praising God and, and the Spirit. It's, real, it's broken out on other college campuses, other places as well. Here's my point. It started with confession. It started with someone coming up and saying, I know that I've been, I've, been, <laughs> I've been living the Christian life, but I've got some things I just need to confess. And I just need to agree with God that these things are coming between me and Him, and there's a wall that I've built up. And I just need to, to come before you and say, God, tear down this wall. God, tear down this wall and change me. And God, work through that. And again, I don't even know that guy's name. I was talking to somebody a little while ago. That's one of the reasons I believe this is authentic is because I don't know the names of anybody that's involved. It's not about people. It's not about Ashbury. It's about Jesus and about the Spirit of God. When we confess our sins, here's what we're doing. We're clearing the deck in our life, just clearing the deck of our heart so that God can have His reign and His run in our lives. And, that, and when that happens the, to the people of God, renewal is real. I just, in the first service, I, I felt led to do this. Let's just do this again. We just bow your heads. We're not done quite yet, okay? So don't get your hopes up. But, but I do want you to just bow your head, okay? Just close your eyes because I want you to kind of block out any distractions that might be around you. Because, you know, there's a time when we just need to confess. And, I, and right now, I just don't really feel led to open us to have public confession yet. <laughs> but will you just spend a few moments with God and say, Lord, Right now, quietly, silently, Lord, would you just shine the spotlight of your Holy Spirit in my life, in my heart, and see if there be any wicked way. Just right now, privately, you and God. 
And the Bible says if we confess our sins, we agree with God about our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. What a wonderful word, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just take these next moments. We're just going to be quiet. And you just spend some moments confessing to God. In the first service this morning, we sang a chorus, and most of you know this. It just says, Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. Keep your head bowed, if you would, just in an attitude of prayer. Can we just sing that chorus together? Let's just sing it. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. Jesus, Jesus, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Spirit, Spirit, I adore you. Lay my life before you. There's one more thing I want to share with you as we finish. We allow the Spirit of God to fill us, to control us. We can't do it. If our mind is focused on the things of the earth, we can't do that. We're obedient to Him. And then here's what happens. Here's the promise. When we do this, we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. Then we, That's when renewal comes in our life. That's when revival, awakening happens in our lives. And listen, awakening is not going to come to our country Don't pray for revival for our nation unless you're willing to be revived yourself, Christians. Verse 11 in our passage says this, and Scott began our service with this. Since the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So Paul's established that. He's dwelling in you. He's living in you. You're indwelt by the spirit of God. Since that's the truth, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So here's what happens. As He dwells in us, as He, as he fills us with His, his power and we're, we allow Him to control our life, the Holy Spirit begins to renew us. He wants us to, just, to allow Him to just keep on transforming us day by day. It's a day-by-day day process. You're not, we talked last week, you're not going to be perfect immediately. Recognize that. And don't let Satan convince you otherwise, that somehow you're not a good Christian because you're not perfect yet. You're not going to be perfect until you get to heaven, right? But day by day, He's continuing to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ, day by day. And that's, that's when we just daily submit to Him. Will you be, just begin your day saying, Lord, I love you. I want to I serve you. I want to honor you. I want to confess these things to you. Show me daily, Lord, areas of my life that aren't pleasing to you. Attitudes, habits that aren't pleasing to you. I read a fascinating story about converts to early when the gospel was taken to Africa. And, and I tell you, revival is happening in Africa as well. But this, this was hundreds of years ago when they, Christianity, Christianity was new there, and, and the, the Africans that became committed to Christ were tremendously earnest and regular in their just daily time alone with God, just private devotions. And they, the story goes that every one of them had their, his own spot. So if you think about the African village, just kind of in my mind, I think of the, the brush there, right? And they would each have their own tree they went to or 
or a place where they went to pray and to spend time alone with God. And so you can imagine that, that as, the, as they went to this place, the path they took became worn. And so you could tell where each person was, you kind of tell where each of the kind of prayer outdoor closets were, right? But the, the problem with that is, is if you, maybe it's not a problem, it's a good thing, I guess. If you quit doing it, then the grass is going to start growing in your path. And so one of the sayings, one of the accountability, kind of a subtle encouragement from the one to another was, brother, the grass grows on your path. And they knew what that meant. And so the question for each of us is, the grass growing on our paths? You can't be controlled with that spirit. Again, he's living in your life. If you're a Christian, he's there. But he's not going to control your life unless you daily come to him and confess and praise him and, and spend time in his word, getting to know him. The lifestyle of the redeemed, the lifestyle of, of the faithful has everything to do with quality. It's not just living long, but it's the daily pursuit of God that we experience and we're going to experience all the blessings that he's promised. So the question is, has the grass, has the grass grown tall on the pathway of your daily walk with God? Let me ask you just to bow your head one more time as we finish. I'm going to ask Matt to come on up. Father, we just come to you now and thank you again for your word and for speaking to us today through it. And all that you want to accomplish in our lives, in our church, in our community. And through us, Father, we can't do that ourselves. And so I just pray now that in this time of response that you would give us wisdom and sensitivity and faithfulness to respond as you're leading in our lives, Father. Encourage us for your kingdom's sake and help us now to respond as you're leading. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to stand. This is the time for us to respond. I'm gonna, I'll be here in the front. If there's a decision you need, just need me to pray with you about or something you want to share with the church today, you come now as we stand and sing and respond to God. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life. All over my life. See the cross. See the cross, the empty grave. The evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave. The evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away. Because of you, oh Jesus, oh, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life. All over my life, see the evidence. I see the evidence of your goodness. All over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment. All over my life. All of my life, why should I fear? Why should I fear? Oh, the evidence is here. Why should I fear? Why should I fear? Oh, the evidence is We'll be dismissed in just a moment, uh, but before we do, I'm going to drop my bulletin. Let me get that.
got a few announcements I want to share with you. Uh, first, Pastor alluded to the first one. Um, starting tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., we will be showing The Chosen, and it really is a, a well-done show. So if you haven't seen it, go online, check it out. Uh, there's probably trailers out there you can check out. And join us tomorrow evening for that. I uh, also want to join Pastor in thanking Carrie Gerland for putting that and bringing it to South County Baptist Church. So thank you for taking the initiative to do that. Saturday, the 25th, uh, Trail Life has their trivia night. It's a wonderful organization, and a great way to support them is to reserve a table, reserve a seat, uh, and, uh, and participate in the, uh, the trivia night. If you can't attend, but you want to join, you want to support them financially, uh, you can call the church office, and we'll help you provide uh, them a financial donation. The resurrection celebration. So I've heard a lot about this event. It's coming up Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is on April the second this year. It's going to be a great event. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you're going to want to be able. To, you're going to want to be involved with that. You can volunteer. Uh, they'd love to have plenty of volunteers. If you want to be involved, find out how you can get uh, involved in that. You can attend the uh, volunteer meeting today. It's at 1215. It'll be a brief meeting, so they won't keep you too long, but they'll provide you information on that. Another way that you can get involved is to grab one of the bags in the gathering area that have empty eggs. So we got bags out there with empty eggs. We need you to take those home with you, fill them up, and bring them back by March 26th. Um, as always, check out the bulletins. There's a lot of great stuff in here that you're going to want to be aware of. So pick one up if you don't have one yet. Uh, gifts, ties, and offerings can be uh, placed in the blue buckets or in one of the ways that's displayed on the screen. Before we uh, dismiss, I'm going to ask Pastor to come back to finish up in prayer. Last week we, uh, we finished with just a time of prayer. We had some specific prayer needs. Uh, two surgeries on Monday and, uh, and others that were in the hospital. And I just, I want to just give you an update. We, we, you know, we pray, we ask God for things. We need to revisit that and see how God answered those prayers. So Frank Myers had open heart surgery Monday morning. Uh, he was one, in the early service. We prayed for Frank. Um, he had open heart surgery Monday morning. He was in worship service this morning in the first service. And he gave a little t a testimony about how God had really worked through his surgery. And the doctor was just amazed at his progress. He said, if, you know, one is the best, he was a one, and the doctors were just amazed. He said, I got a lot of people praying for me, <laughs> and that's why. So that's the praise to God. Debbie Malutmach's surgery was successful. We're praying for so many others. I got word this morning that, um, Dork, that LB Powers is in the hospital. A lot of you know LB. If you're newer, I know you probably don't, but LB and Dorcas have just been integral to our church family since the beginning. Um, they own the Eat Right Cafe, if you're familiar, Eat Right Diner. Um, but LB has COVID. He's in St. Anthony's at Mercy South Hospital. And I just want to ask you to pray for LB. He's, he's been quite sick for a while. Pray for Dorcas. She also has COVID, so she's at home and isn't able to be with LB. And so just let me ask you to pray for them. Uh, Kathy Kowaleski is continuing to recover, and she's had a difficult week. Sid Staten. I can't name everybody, but I just want to, you know, it remind us, church, we're a praying church, and, and we need to lift these up. And so I want to give you the updates because there are a lot of positive ones. And last update I got on Kathy was, was encouraging last night, Debbie. Uh, so can we just finish and pray? And then again, if you're a visitor, we'd love to see you at the welcome desk in just a few minutes. Let's just pray together as we finish. Oh, Faith Spicer, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for standing up. because Faith broke her ankle on Tuesday at wrestling practice. I think next week she'd be defending her state championship. Is that right? And so obviously don't do that with a broken ankle. But the surgery was Friday, an hour and a half, very involved, but it's, they feel good about it and that she will uh, be able to heal up and, and begin wrestling, go to the mission trip in Guatemala early June and then begin her college wrestling career in the fall. And so we pray for Faith too. And, and Faith, we hope you're watching, but you know we love you and we're, we're praying for you as well. All right, let me pray. God, we just thank you for all your love for us, Lord, and for your blessings in our life. One of the great blessings we have is to be able to come together to worship you and to study your word together, to hear, Father, how you answer prayers. Because we, it just reminds us that, Father, we're not just going through a, some kind of a spiritual ritual by praying, Father. We are, we are laying our needs at your feet, the creator of the universe, a living God who hears our prayers. But you don't even just hear them and take them down on a note, Father. You're doing something about them. 
And we trust your wisdom and your power and your love for us enough so that we can, we can have hope, whatever it is that we face in life, Lord. And so as we go from this place, Father, I pray that your spirit would indeed fill us. The evidence of your life would be clear through our lives and that people would be drawn to you because of that evidence. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.